tonight's guest uh, served 24 years in U.S. Naval Aviation. Uh, he has over 3,600 flight hours and over 1,000 carrier landings in the A7E Corsair II and the F-A-18C Hornet. He was the former CEO of VFA 105 Gunslingers and served on the staff of the Secretary of the Navy. He's an Amazon best-selling author of the books Raven One, Declared Hostile, Fight Fight, The Silver Waterfall, and High Desert Reflections. Please welcome Captain Kevin Hoser Miller. Thanks, Chris, and it's great to be you and Carrier Strike Group 3. So the way that uh, these conversations normally go, we'll, we'll just kind of keep it really informal. Feel free to take as much time as you want to talk about whatever comes to mind. Uh, talk about your career, flying the various airplanes, um, obviously your work as an author, um, upcoming work, especially. That was news to me, so excited to hear about that. And uh, people will periodically pipe up with questions if, they, if something comes to mind or they might post it in the chat. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but if that happens, we'll just answer those as we come to them. Thank you for okay. being here tonight. Sounds great. I got my wings in 1983 and uh, sent me to Cecil Field to fly the A-70. Uh, I was assigned then to attack squadron 82, VA-82 aboard Nimitz. And uh, this is 1984 through 87. We did two med deployments and one uh, two-month North Atlantic deployment. Uh, um, spent a lot of time in the Eastern Med, and uh, at the end of the 87 deployment, we took Nimitz around South America and up the West Coast to California, uh, and Nimitz has been a West Coast ship pretty much ever since. Um, after my tour there, and, and I was an LSO there in the in VA-82, so I had that specialty. Then I went over to VFA-106, the FA-18 Fleet Replacement Squadron, learned how to fly the airplane. And I stayed there as a training LSO, taking classes to the ship day and night. Uh, from there, I went to uh, Carrier Air Wing 7 as a CAG LSO aboard Ike. This is uh, uh, right before Desert Storm. Uh, Ike did not participate in, in Desert Storm. Ike was there for Desert Shield and then came home. I joined the ship. And the rest of the Atlantic fleet was, was over there for Desert Storm. But then we went over in late 1991-92 in the, in the Persian Gulf. I then transitioned over to uh, VFA-131. That was my department head tour. And uh, we went to a brand new carrier, George Washington. Did the shakedown cruise with her. And then uh, her maiden deployment in 1994 to the Med. Uh, so wrapped up my uh, department head tour with the Wildcats. Uh, short duty at Tyndall Air Force Base, pushing paper. I wasn't the uh, uh, first Air Force staff joint tour. It's supposed to be good for me. Then uh, selected XO, CO, uh, BFA 105. Uh, I joined the squadron when it was aboard Theater Roosevelt, just wrapping up a deployment. And then we uh, worked up and deployed aboard Enterprise in 98, 99. This is Operation Desert Fox. Uh, throughout the 1990s, I uh, spent a lot of time in, in Southern Watch, uh, no-fly zone patrol and deny flight, no-fly zone patrol over Bosnia. Um, wrapped up uh, the tour with uh, 105 after we uh, home port changed to Oceana, Virginia. Uh, did a year at the Naval War College, fascinating year, and I wish that that everyone could could have that year just to learn about uh, history and, and the, the, the geopolitics of the world. Fascinating. Uh, then all roads lead to the Pentagon, and I had two tours there, uh, one in OPNAV, uh, strategy and policy plans, and then uh, went over to legislative affairs and I, I wore a suit and, and uh, I would go to Capitol Hill and I had the Naval Aviation portfolio. They had a question, I'd get them an answer. It was another fascinating tour. And I got to tour industry and kind of was in on, on how the budget is, is made and, and how all that sausage making works. I retired in, in 05. And I uh, stayed in Washington as a defense consultant. Um, that's what they say in polite company. Others would call that a lobbyist. And then I uh, came down here to Pensacola, and I was the executive vice president of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation for several years. And uh, now I'm, I'm on my own consult and, of course, write. And, uh, yes, you, you've got the litany of, uh, of books there, and that's what I've been doing the past seven years. 
So I heard you say that you are a, a CAG LSO data. Do you have any questions for our guest about LSOing? Yeah, we have a uh, we have a unique situation as we're the are we are the LSO of for DCS, and that is uh, our pilots can ramp strike more than once and still get to fly with us. Uh, so <laughs> we have a special grading tier set up just for uh, just for new guys and and things like that. But uh, on your zip lip approach, when you're coming into the Marshall stack, you know, at two, 3,000, how did you guys determine what that altitude would be? Even though, even though you didn't have comms with those guys, you just eyeball right. it? Right. It's, and it's determined uh, before you launch. Um, when I started out, the, the two F-14 squadrons, uh, were at 2,000 feet, and the two A7 squadrons were at three, and the A6 guys were at four, and the and the the prowlers and and E2 at, at five. That's how it works. And, and today, uh, you know, everyone is a Super Hornet airframe except for the E2s. So, uh, it, and it is it's a, a challenge for guys today. I've talked to them about it, but but if you're in VFA umpty frats, you know that your squadron overhead altitude is say 3,000 feet. And the other two, you know, the 100 and 200 series, they're at, at 2,000 feet. So you know that. And then you're, so now you're sequencing off yourself. The guys at 2,000 feet, they have to break the deck. So they're watching the angle and they're, they're watching, okay, how it's going. When there's a, uh, the, the last guy on cat four, you probably should be heading toward the break at that point, you know, three miles aft. And then you're, you're watching the ship and you see that guy get shot. Okay, good. So they're going to wrap up the deck. And I can come in. If you get to the the ship and they still haven't shot them, maybe it's a uh, you know suspend launch or or whatever. And then you're gonna spin, you know, wrap it up, you know, real, real tight, and don't go out to the three mile initial again. You know, keep it tight. They're probably gonna shoot them. And uh, the, the goal is once Cat Four or Three is shot, a, a minute later there should be an airplane at the ramp. Nice. So. Do you guys actually commence from 3,000 or 4,000, or do you collapse another, down to two? Another great question. So we, we come down. So the, the, the guys at 2,000, you know, they'll, you know, someone is going to be the first to the break, and the other squadron will follow them. And then, yes, we'll come on down and, and keep the pattern full that way. So you'll, you'll depart out of Angels 2 uh, if everything's working well. Nice. Thank you. Sure. So I heard you also say that you were uh, involved with the Naval Aviation Museum. I've been there quite a few times and love that that place. Uh, how's it doing throughout all the the COVID craziness this last year? It's been very hard, and <clears throat> two reasons. Uh, one is you may recall in December of 2019 there was a terrorist attack aboard NAS Pensacola, and this is where uh, three Navy men lost their lives. Uh, you know, in defending schools command against uh, a, a, a terrorist, a Royal Saudi Air Force officer um, who was you know, subsequently uh, taken out. So that investigation and that base restriction is still ongoing, sadly. And uh, you know, the, the museum is on a working Naval Air Station. And um, one of my friends commanded the base and, and he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I command a national park tourist attraction with a, with a Naval Air Station on. I mean, you know, for those of you that have been there before, almost a million people a year, I think, you know, 900,000 legitimately visit that museum. There's also Branca Cemetery, there's a lighthouse, there are other uh, attractions there that are open to the public, but the public has to go through the gate and, and, uh, and show their driver's license and, and all that. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to end. And then COVID made it worse. And uh, so right now, the situation at that museum is if you are active or retired, if you can get on NAS Pensacola, then you can go visit the museum. But if you cannot get on the base, you can't go visit the museum. Um, there's There's been a, an effort ongoing, even when I was there about 10 years ago, to perhaps uh, carve out that piece of the base where the museum and the lighthouse and the, and the cemetery are and allow general access there 
and keep tighter security on the flight line, obviously, and on the, the school's command uh, and we're and the, the A schools over there. Um, and so I, at the Chevalier Field. So I, I, I think that's going to happen this decade, but uh, not in the near term. Wow, I had no idea it was still still closed access like that. Uh, that's really sad. That's a that's a, a wonderful attraction. It is it is it's hard, and it, and I was at the Museum Foundation. Now people often get the two mixed up. There's the National Naval Aviation Museum, which is run by the United States Navy, and then the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation is the .dot org fundraising arm that has built that place. None of the building that you see there or any dollars for aircraft restorations are government appropriated funds are all private funds. So tens of millions over the decades, uh, tens of uh, tens of millions. And, and uh, um, it's, it, it's a challenge to, uh, to, to run that, that organization when you cannot have patrons at the museum that are gonna go to a movie or buy a souvenir or go get a, a lunch. And, and those money-making operations keep the foundation going. Uh, it's been quite a challenge. Thank you for sharing that. Um, do we have any other questions uh, offhand? I have a, a couple of questions. I don't, is this, if it's open forum, if I can jump in, if that's cool. Sure, go ahead, Lucky. Cool. So I was wondering. So through the '90s, there was probably there was a large change. I'm guessing with the introduction of the the stealth fighter, you know, into combat, uh, you know, areas of operation and stuff. And so I was wondering if your rules of engagement changed uh, once those started operating, you know, versus beforehand, and how you guys would deal uh, with operating in the same area as those. Yeah, the the stealth fighter, the uh, F-117. Um. Those guys, uh, I, I, I don't think I ever worked with them. If, if I ever did, I don't know it. And uh, in, in, in my operations, you know, flying over southern Iraq or, or Bosnia, um, my understanding is those guys are on their own program. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so um, I don't have much more of an answer than that. I, I have no experience working with those guys. Cool. Tex, I see you've got a question. Uh, so specifically, you know, related to the F-18 module and DCS, and I know there's probably a lot you can't talk about. We definitely respect that. But, you know, what's one or two things you think they really got right? And then maybe what's a couple of things that are like, nah, that's not even close. I watch Red Kite's videos and uh, and I, I see comments in, uh, and I, I do see them in DCS Facebook page and and, uh, and, and other forums, YouTube. Um, I, I'm impressed with uh, the cockpit layout, all the all the the, the, the deedles and, and warnings. The uh, um, my experience, one experience flying DCS, I thought it handled fine. Uh, they uh, it, the, uh, the the flying the ball is a challenge. You don't have that depth perception, but DCS you know gives you that close up of, of the lens, uh, so you can you can uh, you know get yourself to a to a good start it, it's it's tough and that that case one pattern coming around the corner there off the beam you know, even judging the beam distance in in two dimensions um i i'm not sure if you guys uh, use the, the tack and gouge the tack ends on uh you know 1.2 miles 1.2 1.3 27 degrees angle of bank you know uh, 450 at the 90 and uh you know rolling in the groove at 375 350 start yourself down. Um, the, uh, as far uh, the, the night vision goggles, I, I thought I was impressed when, when I saw that, you know, looking through that, that little soda straw, you know, NVGs uh, provide situational awareness. That's what they do. And, and uh, they're, they're not a, and that's what they are. And uh, they're, uh, I, I first was introduced to them in 1992, uh, the, the first models, and then late in the '90s, we got a, we got a, the second generation. I'm not sure what they're using now. Now they have the, the helmet mounted queuing system. That's you know, which I did not have. The uh, and I and I'm, I think they have to make a decision about uh, what what kind of visor and, and what they you know are they going to bring goggles on on a flight or not. That's that's a decision they have to make when you know it's uh, it's going to be dusk or dawn, uh, in the middle of their their flight. 
kind of a rambling answer. Um, oh, no I, I don't have I don't have a lot of you know experience flying the, the DCS Hornet. Quick follow up: Did you guys ever use MVGs on Case Three, or was that strictly by it's instruments? A, a great question, and we took them off uh, to for to land on the ship, and we would take them off to tank. Uh, the, uh, the the tankers got position lights, and uh, so you know you don't want those those light intense fires right in front of your face. So we would take them off to tank, and so we would we would I would rendezvous with them a little bit, and then getting it, you know. Maybe inside a thousand feet, I'd kind of kind of stow them if I could. Um, we absolutely take them off the landing on the ship. You do not want to eject with goggles, and and it's going to break your neck and you're going to have a bad day. So uh, the procedure is, if you think you have to eject and you're wearing goggles, just take them off and throw them on the floor. Just you know, trash them. I mean, they're they're tens of thousands of dollars. Don't worry about it. You're going to get out of the airplane anyway. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a great question. Do, do not try to land with goggles. On the uh, case three approach, um, in DCS, obviously both in virtual reality or in 2D screens, the big problem that we have, like you said, is depth perception, but also how we perceive light and how how good our eyes are actually in real life at perceiving a point of light. For example, the you know long distance alignment light. In your experience. Is that light really, really visible miles and miles and miles away when, when the weather's clear, obviously, or at night, or is it really, really dim? It's it's dim and visible at at uh, at ten miles away. So at, at ten miles on a clear night, and it can be it can be a dark night, but but clear. And let's let's say that it's uh, there's there's an overcast, but underneath you can you can see the ship. So it is black, and there's no horizon. And you'll see a cluster, a dim cluster in the distance. And at three miles, you can make out the, the, the carrier box. You can see the strobe lights through the middle of the box. And off to the right is, is the tower and the sodium vapor lights that, that illuminate the middle part of the flight deck. Um, and, and of course, the lens, you can see that. But uh, my, my technique was to fly instruments. So 1,200 feet uh, at five miles, you know, I'm, I'm flying my best speed, flying on speed, flying the heck out of the needles. At three miles, I would aggressively push over. I mean, I'd take off a handful of power and push the nodes and then reset it three and a half degrees on your, uh, on your uh, velocity vector is, is going to help you. I'm flying needles. Um, and if I, so I've got mode two needles and I, I'll, I would fly them to the ball call and inside I'd call the ball three quarters. I'm still flying needles to about a half a mile. And, and at the, my peripheral vision, obviously, I'm seeing the lineup and I, I can see where the lens is. But inside a half mile, I would, I would go to the lens more. And now in my peripheral vision, I'm seeing where that velocity vector is going. If it is above the angle, I'm going to start going high. If it is touching the wires, I'm going to start going low. If it's touching the ramp, I'm in deep trouble. So, uh, you know, you guys, you guys can see that uh, on uh, on DCS, and and it would just you know give you an indication of of where you're going. Um, I, I think it, flying the ball on DCS, from what I can see, is a big challenge, and and I think any of you that that can get aboard, uh, that that that's a win. I mean, it's uh, you know we're not we're not talking about you know okay and fair and no great passes here, but but maybe you guys uh, do grade that way. So I, I, I yeah, <laughs> that'd be interesting to find out. So Data here, who asked the first question, he's, he's our <laughs> absolute master of an LSO here. Uh, but we have quite a few LSOs on, on staff, if you like, who, uh, uh, who grade. And we actually take, you know, it, it's great fun for us to actually have the ability to grade. You know, it's, it, the, the simulation is accurate enough where we can most of the time reasonably accurately, you know, grade according to s certain rules, you know, obviously that are... I'm sure slightly different than in real life, but data here makes sure that we get it as accurate as possible. Yeah, we could, we do a little bit of a less stringent grading than uh, real life LSOs. Yeah, I mean, um, the only other advice, motherhood, I can I can give is uh, uh, make uh, big corrections early, small corrections in close, and try to try to leave that nose alone uh, in close. 
yeah. with case threes uh i know the 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 acls system the one before magic carpet was reported to be very unreliable a bear very unreliable system ha- was there did you or anybody in your wing ever have be have it used successfully like getting uh, using it as it was designed or did you guys just never use it at all um the 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 the, the mode two ACLS is, is that what we're talking about? I believe so. Uh, whichever one that actually takes control. Okay. That's mode one. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the mode one has been around since the 1970s as a, as a nugget in the a seven. I, uh, I coupled up one night, I guess I should have told my CO, but uh, uh, so I, I tried it. And then later in my career, when I was a commanding officer, um, at night, I would couple every other night pass for me, and so I'd, I'd hand fly it, couple hand fly, and and so it worked. I mean, you know, mode one, uh, even for F-14s, and that was that was a big struggle in the 1980s. They they had some electronic difficulties, you know, getting all their black boxes to work at the same time. I, I rarely saw it from the A6 or the EA6, but they were all equipped for for mode one. But I, we Hornet guys did did mode one, especially as senior guys, uh, quite regularly. Um, I would say, you know, most every night recovery, you know, someone is going to couple up, and the guys on the ship love it. And and I would I would go into air ops after a flight, and I'd talk to the the uh, you know the second class petty officer that controlled me, and I'd, I'd tell him what what I saw. And what uh, an impression about mode one is that you'll you'll couple up, and then the airplane, the the stick and throttle will start moving, and, and they're moving very violently. But the airplane is rock steady, but the throttles and the stick are just twitching, but the whole way down. I would have my hands, you know, around them nearby if I had to to take over. But uh, no, it, it was a it was a terrific system. Now. That's the good news. The bad news is when it's pouring rain and the ship is bobbing like a cork, it doesn't work. So it's, it's, it's all up. That's why you have to hand fly it um, most of the time. Can you tell us about some of those crazy carrier landings? <laughs> I have a memory uh, uh, in the daytime flying A7s off Nimitz, the, and we're in the, in the Norwegian Sea. We're, we're in the Vestfjord, for those of you familiar. Uh, but, but even in that protected fjord, it's, it's a pretty big one. Um, the, the ship was really pitching. And uh, so I'm coming around the 45 and I see the screws coming out of the water as the stern lifts high. I mean, just, you know, churning up water back there. And so you just, you just keep it coming. Um, the, the deck, it, it looks like you're flying into a wall and then it'll move. And it looks like you're just going to, you know, the ramp is up in your grill. Uh, in those situations, the LSO is going to wave you off the pitching deck. You know, but usually the, the ship will do a, a big hayaka and then it'll kind of steady out. If you're there at the ramp, they'll take it. But if it's, if it's here or here, they're going to wave you off. Thank you very much. No, no worries. Try again or go to the tanker. Um, uh, at, at night, um, you know, you, you can't, you're not going to have the, those visual cues. The, uh, the lens, the, uh, the ACLS cannot keep up with the, with the ship's motion. And we use this thing called Mobilis. It, it, is everyone here familiar with that term? The, the manually operated so. visual landing system? I'll just briefly, it, the LSO, and I used to do this off Norway when I was a CAG LSO, uh, I would manually show using a handle where I perceived the airplane to be on glide slope. So about three miles after the ship, we'd have a destroyer with his lights on, and that was my horizon. I mean, everything's black, but okay, there's, there's a destroyer. And, and the ramp's moving up and down, but but that destroyer is the real horizon. And you can assess where the aircraft is on glide slope. And I would say, okay, you're, it looks like you're floating. So I would show him a high ball. I'd, I'd raise it. And then he would correct. And I'd be talking to him. You're working a little high, a high, power back on, and then trap. So you're, 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 you're moving, you're, you're showing him or her uh, where they are on glide slope. And, and talking to them on the handset at, at the same time, uh, a lot going on there. But uh, it is very rewarding then to go into all the ready rooms and debrief everyone. You're you're a popular guy in those situations. So this is Warhawk here, and my question is not so much DCS related as it is about service related question. 
Uh, I think aside from myself and Data, you know, you're probably one of the few that were in the Navy in the 80s. Um, and my experience, of course, is going to be a lot different than other people's. Uh, I was aboard a, a destroyer tender, the Yosemite, as a matter of fact. Um, in my time in, there was an awful lot of, you know, good natured ribbing back and forth amongst you know, the different departments, you know, sometimes not so good natured. I was a snipe, um, you know, so there, I can neither confirm nor deny that there were times when somebody's air conditioning got shut off in their compartment at a bad time. But, uh, you know, in, in your, it, it, in, in your capacity as, as, as an aviator, uh, did, you know, especially when you transitioned to 18s, did you see a, did you encounter a lot of, you know, that back and forth ribbing between like you and Tomcats or you and other other uh, aviators of other airframes? Sure. And and it's it is, it is a lot of fun. And uh, uh, we, we you know, we had fun with that. And of course, we we would we would abuse our sister squadron. You know, they're, they're just like us, but, but they're not us. And, and uh, uh, you know, we would we would would make fun of the A6 guys. And, you know, and, uh, but we were all very nice to the S3 and E2 guys <laughs> who uh, who. Uh, would tank us and and, uh, and and vector us. So so yes, that 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 type of, of good natured fun happens. It happens at the lieutenant level, um, and then but by the time you're a lieutenant commander and certainly a commander, uh, not so much. You know you don't want to be, you know, you know towel snapping with with your fellow squadron commanding officers. That that's that's good fun when you were younger. Uh, you you got to work together when when you're more senior and. Uh, uh, so we had this thing called Folksal Follies that you guys may have heard of, uh, you know, two or three times during a cruise at the end of a line period, we would, uh, you know, recognize the, the top 10 ball flyers and the top hook squadron, but uh, there, there'd be skits and each squadron would put on a skid. So the air boss always got abused and, and uh, you know, there's always some character in, in the air wing or, or, or ship's company, but you always try to, to make fun of people above you, you never make fun below, and and you know you wouldn't pick on a, a poor a poor ensign that's just doing his or her job for for whatever reason, and, and be, it's kind of a quirky person or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that, that that can that can get out of hand, um, but but we don't let it. It's okay. it, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, it probably explains why Data keeps trying to promote me around here. So. Uh, we're actually oddly enough kind of similar to that us older guys kind of you know poke fun at each other and you know stuff like that but we kind of take the younger guys underneath our wings and uh, so to speak and uh, you know try to be nice to them and stuff mostly we poke fun yeah. at them now and then but mostly i invite you down to uh, 103's ready room sometime yeah the, the boneheads they were uh, they were vf84 in, in my day and uh the jolly rogers when when the uh, I was in Air Wing 8 aboard Nimitz, and, uh, and so was uh, VA-86, which I see is in your strike group. And uh, they, were, they were brand X to us, the, uh, and uh, you know, we, we would laugh at them, and they laugh at us and all that. But no, I, lifelong friends from, from both of those squadrons. Yeah, for us, there's not a whole lot of rivalry between the 18 squadrons, but between the 18 and the 14 squadrons, it's, uh, it's quite comical. Yes. Yeah, we call it the it FOT, the flying sometimes. tennis court. Do you guys still use that term? The nah. flying tennis court. We can't see them. They don't. Keep oh yeah, them. flying parking <laughs> lot. <laughs> they, they can't keep. They can't keep up with this, so it's it's not a problem. They're usually off at the tanker within ten minutes. So, well, can't do much of the fourteen keeps running from the fight. <laughs> hey, we do have a question in our chat <clears throat> from uh, the XO of our VF one eleven group. That says, uh, when you're operating from the ship, he said boat, but he's not a sailor, so I corrected him. Uh, do they do they change the altimeter to uh, two nine or nine or two above eighteen thousand, or do you keep it at QFE? Great question, and uh, it should be above, it should be two nine or nine or two above eighteen. But when we operate off the ship, in it, certainly in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it, but in the med, you know, we just kind of did whatever we wanted. And uh, I, I didn't give a whole lot of thought to civilian air traffic. And, and I, I probably should have, <laughs> especially, you know, in the, in the North, North Atlantic. 
when we're off the coast of the United States in workups, you know, we're in, in warning areas and, uh, you know, we've got the service to, let's say, 430 and we, we wouldn't touch the altimeter. But when we're navigating on airways, obviously, we would, uh, th that, th that was required for, for flight separation. When we were just training, it, it wasn't that important. Um, so I've listened to the, to the Raven one twice and then the other two books uh, once on Audible, and I really love them. And then I also played the, the DCS campaign by Baltic Dragon, and I thought it was great. And I have a question sort of revolving, uh, involving where DCS meet, would, or where DCS Raven one um, would kind of meet real life. And that question is, so the mission where Flip and I believe it's Prince go on that ill-fated BFM uh, trip where they go up near the coast of Iran and then I don't want to give away too much for anybody who hasn't done it yet, but there's an incident up there, right? Um, so when operating uh, near another country like Iran, uh, I, I guess it wasn't really, a, I don't know if in the book it's a, if it's a technically a combat deployment or not. Um, would you be carrying weapons uh, if you were going out and doing BFM practice? Um, and I guess the larger question is, when would you carry weapons on BFM? Um, and do that does that change if you're operating near a potentially hostile country does it change if you're on a combat deployment would you normally have a bar cap up or something like that to kind of to secure that that airspace or how would that all work okay great question um we would not carry live weapons for a in-house 1v1 bfm hub we would have a a CADM, captive carry aim nine on, on one of our wingtips and and uh, and maybe we would have some chaff and flares, probably not, but we would not arm the gun and and nothing a lot. Um, yes, I've I've flown uh, I've flown caps bar caps over the ship in the Persian Gulf, but uh, but I've, I believe that today you've got a cruiser or a DDG and they've got it. You know they they'll they'll just shoot it down and. And so, uh, so, so caps, I think, are uh, yes part of the repertoire, but uh, don't spend a lot of time, you know, on on cap stations over the ship in the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf, I mean, you guys got the the Persian Gulf map. I mean, what is it, 60, 70 miles? But so we, we we would fly in there, and sometimes with with more than one carrier, uh, you had to had to know where you are. There, there's an island in the Persian Gulf, Farsi Island, we called it, uh, which is Iranian. So we had to stay. 12 miles off. We had to stay 12 miles off, uh, you know, Karg Island and end up in the Bushir area where we spent a lot of time uh, as we would, you know, fly into Iraq on our new fly zone patrols or whatever we were doing. Um, so I hope, hope that answered your question. Was it, was it ever hey, Kevin, considered uh, a risk? Uh, was it ever considered a risk to be uh, performing, you know, BFM tactics near a hostile country like that? Or are are you saying you stayed within the defensive perimeter of the fleet while you we, practiced on BFM? Never, you know, the, the Iranians left us alone, and and we left them alone. I mean, but I, I think, you know, I, I, I guess I, I heard of a story, and it might have been during Desert Storm that you know some some excited guy says, "Hey, I've got a I've got a, a fighter here," and you know, and and then it, the Iranian comes up on on guard and says, "Look, I'm just trying to land, leave me alone," or something like that. I mean. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not in, in my day, it was not an issue and I'm not sure it is much more today. You know, obviously, uh, it's a tense situation in the Persian Gulf around the Strait of Hormuz and, you know, there are incidents that you see in the news. It, it, it's serious. We're still going to go up and do a one v one in-house or a two v two in-house. We'll, we'll do that. Hey, Kevin, Greg Harrison here. Uh, former uh, retired black shoe. I just want to thank you for your acknowledgement that we had it. Yeah. Meaning the Aegis guys. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys are, yeah, uh, alpha whiskey. You got it. And, uh, um, you know, I would, I would get, uh, we would train with Aegis guys, you know, we have a, have a young OS that would vector us around and sometimes could couple us up just like the E2 guys could. And, and we would allow them to do that for, for their training. It's fun for them. It exercises the system and all that. It's, uh, you know, you, you may need that capability one day. So, so that, that's what passes for fun on deployment. Yeah, I was, uh, I was out there on the Ike with you. Uh, I was uh, on Cape St. George, actually. I was there in warfare also for the Ike Battle Group. In 91, 92? 
Yep. <laughs> Holy cow. All right, shit, mate. Well, how's this DCS thing going for you? It's hard. I'm a noob. This, <laughs> this stuff is hard. That's why I was a swole and not a daggone brown shoe. <laughs> yeah. I drive ships, man. They're much, they're much easier to maneuver. <laughs> You guys have got the, the, the training and readiness and, and qualifications and, and precision of naval aviation down in your in your virtual strike group. Um, it's kind of a two-parter question, and it has to do with your time in the A-7 and the time in the F-18. Um, from a strictly air-to-ground standpoint, which was more fun to fly when doing training missions or if you actually shot out of both of them uh, for dropping bombs or weapons like that? They, they, they were both great. Okay. And the, uh, you know, we, we would fly low levels around North Florida or anywhere in, in the med. We flew a lot of low levels in the eighties. And then, you know, uh, the fewer number as, as my career progressed. And I imagine even less now, it's just politically harder to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and tactics change of course, but, but, uh, the, the, you know, to deliver a 500 pounder in an A7 or, or in a, uh, same thing, very, very similar switchology, very similar HUD presentations, techniques. Uh, the, uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I had fun flying the A7, uh, although it took me about a year to figure it out. It was a struggle for me. And uh, the A7 was unforgiving. And it was uh, on the catapult, you know, you get the take tension signal, and it would take you 15 seconds from idle to military. And, and uh, uh, so that just gives you a sense of that, that high bypass turbo fan to, to spool up with the Hornet. You needed burner. You got it. And you're, you're out of trouble. Uh, you can turn on a dime. Everything is in front of you when the cockpit is on the throttle and stick. It's just a joy to fly. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I have great memories in, in both aircraft, the Hornet, obviously, uh, uh, not as much endurance as the A7 had, um, but the Hornet was survivable to, to a much greater extent. I mean, the A7 had one good turn. You could get the A7 up above 500 knots, um, but I'd much, much rather be in, in a Hornet and get myself out of trouble, defend myself with all that, all that great radar modes. It's just a joy to fly. Mm-hmm. And then the follow-up question that was after that kind of follows along with the progression of going from the A7 to the Hornet is that, you know, the carrier deck from, you know, the mid eighties to the nineties and the aughts, you had, you went from several different airframes to one airframe, you know, all based on that Hornet and super Hornet airframes. And of course it's changing now with the F-35, you know, now you have a couple more, but um, what's your like opinion on how the Navy went about doing that since you were up in the higher levels of that stuff? Okay, um, so my experience there was uh, about 16, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Super Hornet was, was just entering the fleet at that time. Uh, the, uh, when, when I was there, uh, a big issue was tacker integration with the Marine Corps. Let's have the Marine Corps you know, deploy with the Navy more. And uh, so we, we, had, we had worked that into the, into the program. Uh, the, the Marines, you know, they, they knew that if they wanted the action, they had to go to sea on a carrier and, and, and they embraced it. And uh, just, you know, terrific aviators. They, uh, um, they, they really added to the air wing. I deployed with the Marine squadron, my last deployment, the fabulous checkerboards. And, uh, and, and, and they were awesome. But let's see, as far as procurement at that time, the Joint Strike Fighter contract was signed in 2002 and awarded to Lockheed Martin. So think about that. 2002, and still a JSF F-35 Charlie has not deployed in 19 years. Now it's gonna happen later this year, but we're still not there. The, the, obviously the aircraft has deployed with the Marine Corps and, and the Air Force. Uh, but the Marines decide, hey, we're gonna fly the, uh, the Prowler throughout the teens, and they did until 2019, their last Prowler. And they're still flying Harriers, which are what forty-five years old. I mean, but they're they're they're, they're getting every bit of airframe life they, they can out of those aircraft. Um, so 
I, I'm not sure how to answer your question. There, there's a lot That's going on, you know, as far as as far as a, in the procurement side of the house at, at that time. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, Marine Corps is getting ready to do a big upgrade of their Charlie and Delta models too, aren't they? The last Marine Corps um, squadron on a carrier that they just had their last deployment, I think, earlier this year. And I do not know what the Marine Corps program is with their Hornets. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the Charlies and, and Deltas. I, I believe they'll fly them, you know, for several more years. And I, but I think they're going to fly the Harrier longer, if you can believe that. So I just, I was sitting here thinking, I just came up with another question. I'm sorry, when did you say you were at the Pentagon? From 2000 to 2005. I've always heard conflicting things about why the F-14 was retired. You know, the, the kind of the public released reason was, uh, you know, oh, we couldn't get spare parts for them anymore. Couldn't make spare parts for them anymore because of uh, all the equipment that was used to originally make them were, was no longer available and whatnot, even though that uh, they, uh, they, they had come out with a, Tomcat 21, I think is what they were calling it, a new variation uh, that they were even looking at including uh, stealth technology into. Was it really uh, about the lack of parts and and that, or was it more of a political decision? I think the the F-14 was an expensive airplane to operate. And I I think that there, you know, the part situation can be addressed and you you can get enough parts. But it was a lot of man hours to work on that airplane and to turn it around between events. Lots of, you know, uh, you know, 1960s technology, really. The airplane was introduced uh, at Miramar in 1972, and it had a 35-year run, 34-year run. Um, so airplanes have lives, ships have lives, and you got to you gotta retire them and, and get something else. So I think the other thing about the F-14 mission, it's an interceptor. And we're talking about the outer air battle. Here come the, uh, you know, the backfires with their AS-4s around the Kola Peninsula. We've got to intercept these guys hundreds of miles out of sea. So the F-14 is big. It's got that big AUG-9 radar. It's got to, got to re-operate it. And it carries a lot of gas. And it carries six Phoenix missiles to, to do that. So um, that mission, that outer air battle mission, um, with the demise of the, of the Soviet Union. And, and, and I think with technology that we have other ways to deal with that, to, to include the Aegis that we can place where we need to place it, is uh, we, didn't, we no longer needed an F-14 replacement and a, a Super Hornet uh, production line. You know, you know, thank goodness that the Super Hornet is the F-18 E and F. It was, if it was a new aircraft, we might just be now getting it because of the way that the, the procurement system is now in, in the Pentagon. It, it was designed by, uh, by uh, McNamara, who used that system at the Ford Motor Company, which gave us the Edsel, but I, I digress. But it was that, uh, that, that he wanted to have intention between the budgeters and the programmers, and that just makes it hard to buy things when, when you really need them. It's, it's a very archaic process. One of the biggest problems that our military faces. 19 years from contract to deployment. So I was wondering with the, I mean, there's a whole plethora of different weapons available for the Hornet and more and more were becoming available, you know, later into the nineties with, you know, JSOs, JDAMs, SLAMs, right. And every weapon, you know, not only has its own systems to operate it, right. It's somewhat complex to learn just the weapon, but then there's also the tactics to go with that. And so with only so many hours in the week to fly and then all these different weapons, tactics, you know, um, and, you know, uh, probably dozens of other things to practice too, like flying in no radio conditions and IFR, VFR and all that stuff. How do, how do, would you prioritize what you trained on? And were sometimes certain things left out um, or certain weapons pr- placed at a lower priority than others? Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. And uh, in, in my A7 days, my squadron carried the harm, the AGM-88. And uh, 86, they carried the, the night targeting flare. And that was their area of expertise. So, so we got real smart in EW. Um, and the sidewinders got real smart in, in, in flare. 
now, I, I, but also the, the training um, the syllabus in the 1980s wasn't anywhere near what we have now. Now we have, you know, level two, three, and four. It is very formalized. It is, you know, the, the Top Gun uh, structure has, has, has really permeated the fleet. Uh, that can be a challenge sometimes when, when every day is Top Gun. And, and you, it's, you know, a, 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 here's your 45 minute flight. And then you come back and you, you, you go over for three and a half hours in the debrief and it just, it gets, come on guys, let, let's be realistic here. Um, that, that, that is an issue. And I'm, just like I said, how many hours in the day today, I think that uh, you're going to have your squadron experts. You're going to have one guy in the ready room who knows all about the, uh, the AMRAM. And another guy knows about the Argum, and he knows about all the all the uh, the EW systems that you face, and you know. So I, I think people just just find niches for themselves in, in, in a ready room, or the CO and XO says, "Hey, I want you to make me smart on Slam ER. We're flying tomorrow," and so you get in the books and and, and do it. It, it. it that knowledge uh, can can fade away. Uh, I think that uh, simulation is used to a much greater extent than it was in my day, which is good. I mean, sure, you want to be in the airplane, but uh, the simulators today are pretty awesome, much better than they were in the '80s, obviously. And uh, but but yeah, it's it's a it's a busy day. And in my day, on on a chalkboard, okay, we're going to take off and we're going to go down here to bomb, and then we're going to come back, and then we're going to go to the club. I, it's more than that, but but now it's. It's, it's a big production and very, very um, structured. It, it's better. We just don't want that pendulum to go too far. And I, I think it might be an issue, for, and I, I don't know, I'll put words in anyone's mouth here. Uh, maybe you guys are, are facing that yourself. Yeah, we're, we're actually running into the problem. That's the what we've been trying to figure out in the in at least 86 is there's so much stuff to practice and then you know we find new stuff like oh you know this type of pop-up attack or you know this sort of use regime for the at fleer or whatever and it's you know we've got people who can only fly so much time because of real life constraints and so we're trying to figure out you know how do we actually train everybody on this stuff and you know how well do we want to be trained and so certain things you know get get left out like the the walleye and uh you know the slams and stuff like that so and as an example, in, in my career, I, I got to launch one Maverick, and that was at the, the test range in Utah. Uh, I got to shoot one Sparrow, uh, maybe two Sidewinders, live Sidewinders in my career. Um, uh, that, so the, the, uh, one Walleye. Um, and, and so that, that's a career, you know? So you, you get those, those quals, they, they last years, um, but you, you cannot maintain those calls in everything. You mentioned the debrief earlier, and it's kind of something we've struggled with a little bit recently is, you know, the debrief ended up turning into kind of a, a finger pointing or people getting super defensive. Um, so how would you guys approach a debrief? And is it kind of, I mean, are, are is everyone allowed to talk or is it typically your, your flight leads and COs or, or how would, how would you run an effective debrief? Sure. A great question. And, uh, the flight lead is going to run it. So, so I would be uh, here. I am on the squadron XO, but uh, but the, the lieutenant that I'm flying with is going to to run the flight. And maybe it's a, a call for him to get experience leading, and I'm evaluating him. But I'm going to let him lead and let him lead the debrief. Now, everyone knows that during the flight, who's senior if if something were to happen. But but you let him run the debrief. Now, yes, we have our fragile pilot egos. And uh, so we, you know, there's the term good and bad. Well, we use good and other. And I, I imagine you guys are, are familiar with that. I mean, you know, bad, oh, everyone gets defensive, but, but other isn't as bad as bad. So you can, you can talk about that. So here's at the end, you know, we'll have, we'll, like, we'll draw a T. Okay, here's, here's the G. All, the takeoff was good. You guys taxied really well. Um, and then the, on the other side, uh, we missed our, our time on target by 30 seconds. You know, that's 30 seconds, guys. So another technique is uh, you, you take the who out of it. You know, what were you thinking? I mean, you know, the shields go up. Uh, but, uh, okay, here the, the fighter 
is uh, is over here on on this on this route, and, uh, and and the route is actually five miles to the west. So so the fight and so and then then the guy yeah you're right I wasn't watching. But if if you say you were five miles east and then again shields go up, should try to end the, the debrief on a positive note. To find one, and then okay hey all right we'll we'll hit it tomorrow. Go to the club. That's excellent, excellent ideas there. Thank you. Um, w- what we struggle with the most, I think, is uh, you mentioned, of course, flight lead debriefing. Uh, I guess the rest of the flight and perhaps the rest of the ready room or, you know, part of the squadron. But for us, um, we typically, when we do get together, uh, you know, every few weeks for a larger mission, uh, we would have essentially six different squadrons performing, you know, at least six, if not 12 different tasks and so the debrief just becomes this huge onslaught and and frequently takes way more than an hour for a two-hour mission um so so our um of course following that thinking you just said you know we could take it to individual ready rooms and just debrief our own flight but then we lose the perspective of how that actually affected everybody else so it's really difficult balance to strike for that kind of bigger mission task set um the way that we did it uh, in places like Fallon, Nevada, but but certainly on the ship, you know, even after a, a combat strike, and you're, you know, it's it's a, uh, you know, five o'clock in the morning, you've been up all night, and you just got back, you want to go get some food. Uh, you go to a ready room, and the strike lead would talk about big picture stuff, and you go around the room, and uh, okay, uh, you know, gypsies, what do you guys got? You know, how how were your hits? And and so you talk about that. But then you go back to your squadron, just the, the four of you or the, or the two of you, and you talk about, okay, what, what happened in our formation? Do you remember when we joined up and, and I, I couldn't reach it on, on Strike Common? Or you know, things like that are discussed then. Those, those, we can keep those little things in-house, but we can make our formation better. Uh, but, but yeah, you got to do that. And so in, uh, in, in, in workup training in Fallon, uh, I'd be a strike leader. And, uh, you know, the brief might be 0730. You get there earlier to set everything up. The brief is an hour and a half. And then you go and have your element brief, the strikers, let's say, or maybe the sweep guys at that element. And then maybe have a little 30-minute brief with the, the two or four of you just, you know, flying your airplanes. Go fly the strike. You come back, get a Coke and a candy bar, and then you'll spend an hour and a half in the big auditorium with everyone and then neck it down to the small formation. Then those uh, top gun instructors at Fallon would take me as the strike lead and bring me aside for probably another hour one-on-one where I could have done better as a, as a strike leader in, in planning and execution. So that's a day long event and, and the sun is setting uh, at, 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 as that ends. It, it makes, it, it's good though. And, and I talk about this in, in high desert reflections. I think that's the struggle we have is, you know, for us, time's limited and, you know, we don't have hours and hours to debrief. So really trying to find, you know, what's valuable and, and we, you know, we don't want to just sit around for an hour and, and not get anything out of it. So it's uh, it, for us, it's definitely one of the, the more challenging things uh, that we're trying to figure out. Yeah, the, the, the high points. Uh, Kevin, I wanted to give you a little bit of an opportunity to talk some about the your writing. Um I'm a huge fan of Raven One, and I'm, I'm about three quarters of the way through uh, Declared Hostile right now, and uh, wearing my Raven shirt. All right. <laughs> um, I just want to give you some a uh, chance to speak to your books, um, where people can find them, also the DCS content that you've been uh, working on. I'm curious to hear about the the upcoming work. Raven One, Declared Hostile, Fight Fight, the trilogy, the Flip Wilson trilogy. Um, each uh, in a different part of the world, each where, where Flip gets promoted, every book, and, and Flip will go to see again. He's got, he's got another promotion coming. Um, what, I, what I like to do is, uh, is just show readers, you know, what it's, what it's really like. You know, the things that we're talking about now uh, can, can be drudgery. But uh, so in a book, it's got to be faster and funnier. So you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have guys like like Prince who are kind of difficult, and then something really bad happens to him. Um, 
the, the response to the books has been overwhelming. And I, I didn't expect it. But I thought, okay, Raven One. I, I knew when I finished Raven One in, uh, in, in 2009, I finished it actually. And uh, I, I knew that I had something. And uh, but it took another five years to finally get it published. That's a, it's a, another story. But right off the bat, the reviews came in and, and people uh, just they just resonated with them. And uh, so I said, OK, I'll, I'll write another one, another part of the world, another um, another interpersonal challenge. And so what I like to do is I like to write interpersonal challenges that are found in the squadron ship level because they are we're all human. You know, we, we go to offices, we're in virtual strike groups. You know, there's there's human friction from time to time. We still love each other at the end of the day, but, you know, it happens. Um, but also the humanity of whoever the enemy is. That doesn't mean that the enemy should be forgiven for bad behavior, but they are human and they have different perceptions, especially uh, in, the, in the People's Republic, as an example, uh, in South America. They have a different perception than we do. And so uh, the, the military gets tasked uh, by Washington and uh, guys like me and, and guys like you who served are at the end of the whip. Uh, and so I think that the reading public can, can, can see that. Wow, this is, you know, we, we just see it on the 630 news, but these guys are, this is what it's really like when you're out there. Um, and then I wrote, the Silver Waterfall, and this is something that, that I, I always knew I would write one day. And this is a historic fiction about the Battle of Midway. And I wrote it like Michael Shara wrote The Killer Angels without changing any facts. And it's it's as accurate as I can. And so I've got some great assets here in Pensacola to do research on primary source documents. And uh, so that was released uh, a year ago this week. This, this week is the anniversary of the Battle of Midway. And uh, the, the reception for that book has also been, been very pleasing to me. Um, I got a nice note from the director of Naval History, said it's the, the best uh, fictional book on Midway he's read. It's historic fiction, but it doesn't change any facts and doesn't have like a sappy you know, love angle that you just kind of throw in because you think you have to. It just deals with what really happened to the real men from uh, June 4th through 6th, 1942. So I uh, hope you guys will, uh, will give that a look also. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the last, uh, you also asked, where can you find them? Everything's on Amazon. Um, and uh, kevinmillerauthor.com will send you to Amazon. And uh, social media, uh, Kevin Miller Author. Hey, hey Kevin, uh, I'm a SWO. I hope these are on tape, right? They, they're all on audio. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Because, you know, yeah. Swoes don't read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Swoes can write. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Is there any plan for a movie? Because that would be really cool. Um, Raven One was looked at by a Hollywood director that you guys have perhaps heard of, and I'll, I'll drop his name, Michael Bay. And uh, he, uh, I have a, a friend who, who's connected to him. And so he took a look at it and said, now there's not enough action. And okay, I, I, I get it. You know, you, you know, big explosions and, and all that, that that's his thing. And, uh, you know, in, in Raven one, when you really get down to it, there's not all that much flying. Uh, the flying that is there is, is quite detailed and goes, you know, several chapters per hop, but um, there's more flying in, in the subsequent books. Uh, but there's a lot of that, that interpersonal ready room trauma. There's the challenge of saint and uh, that, that, that flip has to get through. And, and, and the JOs are doing JO things. And, and uh, you know, flip is being pulled in, in, in every direction. You know, his wife is not a happy camper back home. And that's, that's reality. So uh, that, that's, that's what I wrote. Just flying scenes. There may not be a lot of them, but the ones that are there are pretty intense. They're, they're intense. So how about the uh, DCS content? I know you got the yeah. Raven 1 campaign. You said you were working on another one. The, the Raven 1 campaign, uh, Baltic Dragon. Now, I was introduced to Baltic Dragon a couple of years ago through uh, Jello ILO, who you guys know. And uh, I I was aware of DCS in, in reviews. 
Um, I, I would read a review of, of Raven One, let's say, and say that this is great for, for DCS pilots and DCS, DCS. So I kind of did some reason. Wow, they're, they're, I guess there's these these guys that uh, that, that fly hornets. And, uh, and I was approached by Jello who bought the drag and said, Hey, I know that you interviewed Kevin Miller on, on the fighter pilot podcast. And there's going to be another uh, podcast on Friday about the battle of Midway that Jello interviewed me. Um, and uh, so we did all the due diligence and we set about and, and Baltic dragon took Raven one and put together the missions and he would send them to Jello and I, and we'd say, yes, 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 no change this. Yes. And, and that was quite a process. But uh, later this year, this fall, you guys are going to get to fly Dominant Fury, Raven One Dominant Fury. And, and this is all public knowledge. Uh, it's going to be using the Syria map. And it's going to be set in 2005. And this is when Flip is a junior department head before the, the infamous Raven One cruise in the Gulf. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to find trouble in the Eastern Med, we found a lot of it. We've uh, we've mapped out uh, 12 of the 15 missions that you guys are gonna get to fly. Uh, really intense. I've learned a lot about DCS in the past couple of years. And so, uh, um, you know, Raven One is advanced. Um, you guys won't be disappointed. It's been really Before cool reading the uh what look, looking at the the big google document that has all the layouts of the uh of the all the voice lines for all the missions it's been really cool watching the comments you make you and jello make and with bd with baltic drag and stuff like that figuring out like what works here and what doesn't you should say this here not this or like different details about certain pattern like stuff about the case three patterns and whatnot it's been really cool a lot of details oh yeah and and, and jello is the, the way it works is that i I'm the writer, so I uh, I do the strike planning and write out the script, and uh, and, and Jello keeps uh, all of this honest with uh, with, with the, the, that Top Gun precise calm and and and, and good on him, uh, and then uh, and then BD of course knows what DCS is capable of, and, and we pushed BD uh, Super Carrier has uh, you know has a lot of uh, enhanced modes, and, uh, and and now the Syria map has Cyprus. And we can we can do things with divert fields there, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna have I think using supercarrier alone uh, things that DCSers have never been able to do before. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of changes and stuff just recently while building this campaign. That's kind of thrown a wrench into some things and then added more capability to others. So I know it's been a challenge for Baltic to try and get all of that in. It, it has, but he has risen to the challenge. Is there going to be a co-op version of the campaign? People could make videos about it. I think, I think the answer is no for, for this, this, uh, this upcoming Raven 1 Dominant Fury. Uh, I believe the, the next plan is an F-14 game with the Spartans in, in, in the Raven universe on, on Valley Forge. Um, I'm not, I don't think multiplayer, though. That's awesome news. Yeah, I could probably speak for the rest of the group and say I'm gonna be <laughs> I'm gonna be buying that the day day it comes out. So I'm very excited for that already. Well, I, I just want to you know thank you guys. I mean, um, I, I'm gratified that that all of you are are enjoying it, and uh, and, and the DCS community has uh, Baltic tells me that it is three times better than any previous campaign. Yeah, everyone was fantastic. It was probably one of the best campaigns that I played. It was very hard. I uh, I hadn't done a lick of AAR prior to playing the campaign, and I had to learn the hard way. Like in the first mission on the tank on the S three, was not fun. <laughs> you got a tank to get back to the ship. That's where the food is. The other thing that's been great too is the I don't know if you know this, but the 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 resources you've been able to provide uh, just inadvertently, I think through the books, through the DCS campaigns, and all that stuff. Because we also make some of we all make our own missions that we fly here. Uh, so we have a couple, No, nobody that measures up close to what Baltic Dragon can do uh, with the mission editor, but we got some people who are, who are pretty good with it. Um, and I think uh, they draw inspiration, you know, from, from Raven one. I, I myself have gone through the book a couple of times, scouring for little details to, to pick out and try and implement into the missions to make things more realistic. So it's been a great resource because you can't find a lot of that detail, you know, in other places. So, Hey, lucky. Yeah. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I'd like to see it. 
You know, something that we used to do off the ship that was that was fun. It's just bombing the wake. And uh, you know, in in December, Baltic and Red Kite. You know, Baltic put together a multiplayer and they and they bombed the wake. Perhaps you guys saw it. Uh, and I think that mission was offered free. Um, not sure if you guys have played it or not, but I, you know, we used to do that, and that was that was better than just sitting around the ready room. Uh, but but uh, obviously it exercises the, the, the system and and uh, you know we we take off maybe hit the tank for two thousand pounds we go bomb the wake and after you bomb the wake strafe the wake and uh, oftentimes the carrier would would tow a spar we call it this is something like a, that that would make a splash in the water about a thousand feet behind the ship and uh, we would try to hit that spar with a with a Mark seventy six twenty five pound bomb uh, with Strafing, don't hit the spar. Don't don't shoot it. We would uh, we would aim aft of it. We do a flyby for the guys on deck, and then you know have a nice precision landing, and that that was a great afternoon. So, Chris, how many how many total guys do you think we have? We have got three eighteen squadrons with at least ten people in each squadron, and two F fourteen squadrons with about twenty guys, ten pilots, ten Rios, and one and probably about five pilots and three Rios and the other. So we got a pretty good sized group here. So uh, we really loved you coming and talking to us. It was amazing. Thanks, sir. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's uh, you know, a great talking to fellow aviators about flying. And, and uh, again, you guys have a wonderful website. Your, your approach to, uh, to what you're doing is, is just impressive. And it's, that's a, the best word I, I can come up with. And I know you guys are, Having fun is it's gratifying. So good on you. Thanks for coming out. Really appreciate you taking the time to answer all our dumb questions. And, yeah. yeah, no, they're they're, they're great questions. I, I thank all of you guys for uh, uh, thank you for reading the book and and your support and and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get another book for you in another year or so.